January 1942, and in those sunny states along America's east coast and southern shores, the living was easy. For vacationers, the war in Europe that the United States had entered just three weeks before seemed a long way away. At night, the coastal neon burned brightly, from New York to Florida and down into the Gulf of Mexico. Life was still carefree, the bloody conflict in Europe a distant newspaper headline. Americans were unaware that just a few miles off their shores lurked one of the world's most potent military forces poised to strike against their country. Hitler's U-boats had arrived on the American seaboard. Vessel after vessel went down from Maine to Florida, into the Gulf of Mexico and through the islands of the Caribbean, all waters protected by the United States Navy. The German U-boat fleet had its way with the American coastal waters. In what has to be reckoned one of the greatest maritime disasters of all time, it was certainly the greatest defeat at sea suffered by the United States Navy in World War II. By the time that the United States finally got a grip on the situation, almost 400 ships had been sunk with the loss of about 5,000 lives. Admiral Dönitz, head of German U-boats, had devised a daring attack on American coastal shipping, which was implemented 10 days after Germany declared war on the United States. Five U-boats were readied and secret orders issued to their commanders. We left uh, Lorient on the 23rd of December, 41, and I, I want to, to leave before Christmas because I don't want to have uh, drunken sailors on board. And uh, on uh, Christmas Eve, uh, we submerged and then we make a German uh, Christmas. We had Christmas trees on board and uh, parcels for every man of the crew. I read uh, the Christmas story of Lucas number two, and uh, we were singing Christmas chorals and so on. We had a special good dinner, and uh, for some hours uh, the war was very far off. It, it was uh, the most uh, impressive Christmas Eve I had in my life. Hardigan set course for America, 3,000 miles away, in his Type 9 U-boat. Four others followed him. I had the order to go to New York and to be there on the 12th January and not to attack other ships. They were to strike all at once on the same day against targets of opportunity. They were not to operate as a wolf pack, but to operate independently to find targets, hold off, and then on January 13, strike at once in an operation that Dernitz called Haukenschlag, drumbeat. Haukenschlag meaning the sudden beat of a drumstick against the tympanum or drumhead of a drum. We had no charts of the American coast. I had no navigation aids at all because if uh, Dönitz would have uh, all the charts of uh, East Coast of New York, maybe one spy uh, remarked it and then uh, the enemy would have known that uh, John Submit wants to go to uh, the East Coast of the United States. And so I had only a small uh, atlas von Knauer of the American coast. There was only a, pl a small plan of New York and uh, that was all. Unknown to him, and to the other four U-boat commanders as they made their way west across the Atlantic was the fact that the British Admiralty in London was reading all of their radio traffic to and from Admiral Dernitz. And they were able to plot the position, course, and speed of each of the boats day by day. And they gave all of that information to the United States Navy. The documents and the daily situation maps of the United States Navy itself show just how detailed U.S. knowledge was of the approach of that fleet. And yet, when the fleet arrived, the United States Navy did nothing. The 21 destroyers that had been harbored by Admiral King, the chief of the entire United States Navy, 
for the purpose of resisting a German invasion fleet if it should come, were not sent out for that duty at all. The lights were all left on so that the German U-boats could silhouette their targets easily against coastal cities. The lighthouses, the buoys were all lit up. It's as though the United States was not at war. When I came to New York, I saw the lights of Coney Island, of the amusement park, and uh, it was all full light. During that successful week, we were operating there. We saw cars driving along the coast road. We were so close, we could smell the forest from where we were. It was like a deep peace time. And that was amazing for me, and uh, we were very astonished. Afterwards, uh, when I learned that uh, Admiral Ernest King knew that we came, it is much more <laughs> amazing for me that he did nothing. I think that we'd have 15 to 20 ships in sight at any given time, because they'd all be showing their navigation lights. And we could more or less pick and choose which ship we wanted to attack next. For us, this was totally unexpected. If you compare it with the way the U-boats had to fight in the North Atlantic or elsewhere against stronger and stronger defensive forces. Canadian waters where two of the U-boats of Drumbeat were assigned. Those U-boats were so harried by Royal Canadian destroyers and aircraft that they were forced out of Canadian waters and fled south to the more benign waters of the United States. But the U.S. Navy did precious little but to twiddle its thumbs and to watch a carnage develop the like of which had never happened in American waters in modern times. If you take all five of the U-boats, they sank 25 ships on that one Operation Haukenschlag, Operation Trumpy. After three weeks, the five successful U-boats returned to Lorient in France, the U-boats' operational headquarters. Dönitz's goal of severing U.S.-British supply lines had taken a dramatic step forward with Hartigan's American success. Hartigan was a hero. That was a, a very big welcome. I had uh, 10 pendants on my telescope uh, from, from the United States. There were a lot of people, and nice girls came with flowers and kissed me and so on. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was very nice. Dunes came on board and she uh, gave me the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross on my neck. And then there was a guard of honor, and I uh, had to pass this guard of honor. They were always uh, a nice welcome, but this welcome was a special big one. We were the first of the five boats to return from the mission to the U.S. coast. So the propaganda made a great feature of it. I recall not liking that very much, I have to say honestly because we hadn't encountered any resistance and we had been successful without having really been attacked in any way by the enemy. That's why my feelings were a bit mixed. Captain Leuten Hardegen was seen as a man who could go with impunity, which in fact was largely true, right up to the North American coast. It was the best choice for Admiral Dernitz to move his chess pieces into an area where they were safe, where they could have a high toll for their armament, where they could pin down a great number of forces and also destabilize Allied operations. The U-boat that underpinned these long-distance operations was the Type 9. This is the last remaining one in the world. A Type 9C would average more than 100 days at sea for each patrol. They did not operate in packs, but typically individually, as lone wolves. And usually they operated against independently rooted ships, 
in more distant zones where there were no escorts. And the commanders of these boats tended to be older men who embodied the virtues of maturity. Commanders would be on their own to make up their decisions about what kind of targets they could attack or avoid. Discretion was also an important part of being a Type 9 commander because the Type 9 boats were more vulnerable. Being larger, it took longer for them to dive. They were more sluggish, would have much more trouble eluding anti-submarine weapons used underwater. Although the Type 9s never represented more than 12% of the total U-boat fleet, they nevertheless accomplished 37% of all the sinkings achieved by German U-boats during the war, which is a reflection of the fact that U-boats really operated best against unprotected individual ships. As soon as they were up against convoys, it was a very different story. Extra torpedoes were loaded for these long distance operations and meticulous attention was paid to provisioning. Each Type 9 was totally self-sufficient. Now, when we left port, of course, we used every little nook and corner to stash provisions in there. And you see some of the provisions hanging from the so-called ceiling. There are hams, there are sausages hanging there, crates on the bottom with eggs and uh, lemons, potatoes. Uh, that was all fresh food that we needed to eat first before we went to the canned goods. The potatoes tasted of diesel oil. Everything tasted of diesel and of the stench in the submarine, which was the smell of diesel oil, the crew's sweat and the toilets. This was a potent mixture which formed the deposit on the food. When the crew was back on land again, the food didn't really taste of anything because the stench wasn't there. Frankly, personal hygiene was non-existent. Uh, we didn't pay too much attention to it. Of course, we had no bathing facilities, except occasionally we could turn on a water hose and rinse ourselves down with salt water, with sea water. We couldn't do that very often. The opportunity just didn't arise. We were issued perfume by the gallons almost, and we took that along. That was supposed to relieve the odor a little and a substitute for water. We rubbed ourselves down with perfume, and it was called 4711. It was a very, very famous perfume. Of course, we didn't uh, use that much of it. We preferred to take it home to our mothers and girlfriends. It was a, it was a neat present. To this day, <laughs> I really can't stand the smell of 4711. Following Group Hardigan's initial attack on America, Dönitz sent successive waves of his U-boats against the unprotected merchant shipping passing through American coastal waters. These onslaughts also met with massive success and minimal opposition as they headed further south. Texas had become a major oil producer, and since petroleum products were so vitally important in the war effort, the German Navy soon realized that the amounts of petroleum products coming out of the Galveston, Houston, Texas City area were vital. They then decided to come and make the attacks in the Gulf because almost half the oil in the United States was coming out of this little area. The first four or five sinkings were reported in the newspapers. Then suddenly the news stopped any reports of the sinkings altogether. All in all, in the almost two years they were in the Gulf, they sank 56 ships and damaged 14 more, which made a total of 70 ships. That was a major victory that people are unaware of to this day. Two lifetime friends meet to reminisce. One of the most daring attacks on American shipping took place just off the Florida coast near Jacksonville. It was experienced by Phil May and Vernon Townsend. Phil May and I had dates with two of our classmates in high school. We drove to the beach, went to the boardwalk, which had uh, Ferris wheels, merry-go-rounds, and so forth. We were riding on the merry-go-round, and I remember coming around, facing the ocean, and looking, just, you know, you're looking out at the ocean anyhow, and all of a sudden, here's this 
gigantic ball of fire right straight out in front of us. Within 30 seconds, somebody said, U-boat. Commander of that U-boat was Reinhard Hardigan, his prey, the Gulf America. Of uh, St. Augustine, I saw a big tanker and torpedoed her, and she was burning very hard. And I want uh, to uh, finish her with my gun. As they, the fire was blazing, we could, I could actually see the outline of the deck gun on the submarine and the conning tower as they fired. It was a very dramatic sight. And it was very intimidating to realize that uh, they could have turned their guns toward us, which they did not. I uh, went around the ship because I thought if I would uh, shell her from the seaside, maybe if one shell will miss the ship, I will hit a hotel or innocent people ashore. It was uh, difficult for me because my boat was silhouetted against a burning tanker and I had no opportunity to escape if a destroyer or a gunboat will suddenly come because uh, in shallow water I cannot dive, I cannot submerge. We had read about the war in Europe, but this was the first time we had seen the war. And we were dumbstruck that anyone would do that so close to the United States. I just could not believe the war had come right to our front door. And, uh, you know, at 16 years old, I thought, my gosh, you know, we are really in the war. 19 men died that night in the burning oil, almost half the tanker's crew. This tragedy forced Admiral King to halt oil tanker traffic on the American East Coast for a month. As U-boat attacks on American coastal shipping escalated, so did public alarm. The public, I think, became more and more paranoid about the U-boat operations. An air of suspicion prevailed. The FBI even had people in Galveston spying upon each other to report who went in and out of certain houses. People were afraid that there were some people sending out secret messages to the U-boats because no one could figure out how they knew where the ships were. It was all a very mysterious thing and people were looking for Germans to come to shore in rubber dinghies. They even thought that they had come and snuck in sometimes and gone to the movies and had bought groceries. People were also afraid of possible sabotage. They thought that the enemy was going to sneak ashore and blow up the refineries and all of these petrochemical plants, which were highly explosive, that existed right there close to Galveston. There was just a lot of fear of the unknown. The fear of German landings on American beaches was not misplaced. In early summer 1942, at this spot on Pontevedra Beach, Florida, the nightmare became a reality. Four Nazi saboteurs were put ashore by U-boat. They slipped inland under cover of darkness. They were to rendezvous with four other enemy agents who had made a simultaneous U-boat landing at Amagansett on Long Island. This was Operation Pastorius, a Nazi plot to blow up American industrial plants damage war production and achieve a devastating propaganda coup for the Third Reich. In these dunes, they buried cases of explosives and detonators before heading for New York. The plot was swiftly betrayed by two of its members, although FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover claimed the credit for their capture. Their cache of explosives in the Florida dunes was dug up by FBI agents and the conspirators were tried by a hastily convened military commission in Washington. Within weeks, the two informants were jailed and their six fellow spies executed at 14-minute intervals, the fastest multiple electrocutions in American history. To protect America, the Coast Guard formed beach patrols. In Texas, they took to the saddle. We patrolled the beach at night, horseback, and to start with, we had uh, we had, they gave us shotguns and we didn't have any shells for a month or two. We started out riding our own horses. And uh, later on, the, the ship some crazy horses that never had been ridden. It was quite a show for a while until we got them, kind of got them trained. We ride about 15, 20 miles a night, back and forth along the beach. 
We were told to look for a spy that probably the U-boats had put out to come ashore to, uh, like, sabotage Beaumont or Port Arthur, the refineries, and any lights or anything that might be out in the Gulf. While the Coast Guard prepared to repel enemy landings, the U.S. Navy failed to sink a single U-boat in the three months following the launch of Operation Drumbeat. It was all too easy for U-boat aces like Erich Topp. They were unprepared for it. The security forces were untrained, and they hadn't established a convoy system. So to that extent, it was child's play. And all the commanders who took part launched up huge successes there. It was obvious that the Americans were not prepared for war. Commander Erich Topp returned home from America to a rapturous dockside welcome. Dönitz's bold initiative against U.S. coastal shipping and the overwhelming success of his U-boat men in their strikes at the heart of the enemy had not gone unnoticed by German high command. Reinhard Hardigan and Erich Topp were summoned to Hitler's headquarters in East Prussia to receive the Führer's personal congratulations and the addition of oak leaf clusters to their knight's crosses. German success spelt disaster for merchant seamen. Sailing in American waters had become a hazardous undertaking, especially for tanker crews. We were running coastwise much of the time up to New York from down here in Texas. Cape Hatteras seemed to be the big, big bugaboo. Up there, it seemed like a, a kind of a, a junction point for everybody to go to Europe or go to New York or Boston, and uh, the submarines seemed to hang out right around Cape Hatteras, which is known as Torpedo Alley. Most of the time, we got in that area while we'd all be wearing our life jackets and being prepared to abandon ship at any time, because it just took just a few minutes when a tanker got hit, to, the whole thing would be enveloped in fire, and it'd be just a terrible situation. And you're going to abandon ship while they had these life rafts that would uh, just slide off by gravity. And all somebody had to do was just cut the line and the raft would go floating off and it had, it was made up of barrels and planks. Our company had two boats that were sunk in the Gulf of Mexico, but uh, we really didn't realize how bad it was until the war came to an end. Surprisingly, the U.S. Navy was very slow in putting into effect the convoy system, which had worked really well in World War I. It was just incredible that these ships, tankers kept sailing singly across the Gulf of Mexico and got blown up just one after the other. From the point of view of uh, the British, it was particularly galling because we had successfully convoyed ships across the Atlantic only to see them sunk when they were running down the American coast um, under the alleged protection of the United States Navy. Um, and in particular, we were losing a lot of tankers that way. And of course, tankers, fuel oil, fuel petrol, was absolutely vital to the British war effort. The six-month disaster that took place along the east coast of the United States, in the Gulf of Mexico, and in the Caribbean, could have been averted in great part if Admiral King, who held all of the strings of anti-submarine warfare in his own personal hands, had done a number of things. First, if he had heeded British intelligence that was reaching him each day from the Admiralty in London, and if he had heeded British tactical doctrine for fighting U-boats, hard-earned knowledge that the British gave Admiral King and his subordinates. But Admiral King did not heed either because he was an Anglophobe. He detested the Royal Navy and particularly its intelligence. And he simply refused to accept the idea of convoy on the ridiculous ground that this was really defensive warfare. But of course, as the British had learnt the hard way, convoy actually is offensive as well because the U-boats have to go to the convoys, then you've got a chance of sinking them. The second thing he could have done and did not was to turn out the lights. He decided to order that the lights be dimmed but not blacked out. 
And so the massacre continued as the U-boat commander said, even with the dim out, we're able to see our silhouettes very clearly. Admiral King finally responded to the catastrophe off America's shores. Hundreds of small boats, schooners, shrimpers, and even private yachts were requisitioned to patrol U.S. coastal waters. To man these ships, the Coast Guard Auxiliary was formed. An early recruit was Charles Stamey. There were no, no physical, no experience necessary, no qualifications. If you were breathing, you were in, period. In fact, all of these Coast Guard Auxiliary boats, they didn't have any navigation equipment at all, nothing. There was nobody on that boat that could tell at any time exactly where we were, nothing. If, if you saw something happen, if something happened out there, you could radio into the Navy base there at Galveston and uh, say, hey, you know, here's what, what's going on. Well, and they, where are you? And about the only thing you could tell them is, uh, beats the hell out of me. Another recruit sent out to confront the U-boats was Walter Daigle. The ship I was on was a two-mast schooner. We had a diesel engine besides the sails. We were given pictures of German U-boats, so we had an idea of what one looked like. We would go out 12 miles. And we patrolled the Gulf of Mexico, and we spent our time scanning the horizon with binoculars for several days at a time before we returned to uh, Pier 12 in Galveston. Initially, we had three boats in that auxiliary. These boats had a 50 caliber machine gun mounted on the deck up front, and it had four ash cans, commonly called depth charges, that were on racks, and uh, that was it. If we do dropped one of those depth charges, I don't think we could get up enough speed of the boat to get away from the explosion, so you'd blow yourself out of the water. What would have happened if we saw a U-boat? We would have attacked it immediately. That was our goal. I'm sure we would have did that. We would have fired depth charges. What would happen after that, I have no idea. It, it was suicide. If you went out and challenged one of those big German submarines, it would be like challenging a, a battleship in a rowboat. They would probably have used the deck gun and just sunk us right there. That would have been the end of it. Passengers board a ferry near Cape Hatteras on the North Carolina coast. Their destination, Ocracoke, a remote island on the Outer Banks. Wartime residents have their own special memories of the U-boat war. Arnold Tolson. I was in the Coast Guard, Chief Petty Officer in charge of the 83-367, the sub chaser. Our, our main duties was to protect the shipping up and down our coast. In fact, we were all after German subs. Uh, you could come beside one ship and count 15, 16 more stacks at one time in the ocean, which had been torpedoed. It was a bad, bad time. His Majesty's ships come over and helped us patrol this coast, trying to rid the coast of the submarines and the menace. And that was one of the reasons that the HMS Bedfordshire was over here. Her and several of her sister ships come over to help us protect our coast. We did not have in this country, we didn't have any anti-submarine fleet uh, capable of doing the job. HMS Bedfordshire was one of a fleet of British uh, anti-submarine vessels that came over to answer a, a very desperate call from the U.S. Navy uh, for assistance against the submarine sinkings, which were uh, reaching a crescendo in March and April of 1942. The Bedfordshire was one of 24 that went across to the States. We sailed down to Norfolk, Virginia, then down to Moorhead City, which was our base. And we worked from there, convoying, escorting, then patrolling. In May 1942, HMS Bedfordshire was U-boat hunting off Ocracoke when tragedy struck. That night, on May the 11th, we were tied up to the dock at the Coast Guard station. 
It was an awful boom. It shook the island. And just a minute or two later, there were another one. And that what got my curiosity up for to come over here the next morning, look and see if I could find out what happened or see what was along the shore or what have you. Arnold was to recover four bodies from the ocean. There were no survivors from the Bedfordshire, but there was one miraculous escape. The night before the Bedfordshire sailed, Sam Nutt had been picked up by the Moorhead City Police and detained. I never did know what the Americans were going to charge me with. I spent a day and a night in uh, cells, and uh, they let us out, and uh, the American soldiers took us down to the docks to join the Bedfordshire. But she'd gone to sea. We had to go aboard another boat to go and look for the Bedfordshire. They was gonna take us out to join the ship at sea. But when we got there, there was no, no trace of her at all. It was assumed the Bedfordshire had been the victim of a U-boat attack. This was confirmed after the war in the captured patrol diary of U-558. She had sunk the Bedfordshire with one of her torpedoes. As a tremendous outburst of compassion on the part of the local citizenry hereabouts. These residents of this rather isolated island, they all recognized the fact that these chaps had given their lives uh, in defense of, in effect, the United States at the time. And they are the ones who suddenly take this to heart and say, we're going to take care of it. They did, and they continue to do so. The residents of Ocracoke created this corner of a Carolinan field that is forever England. It's a measure of the deep affection felt by a small American community for the crew of an obscure little ship that became a casualty of the U-boat war far from home. I think they're a damn good crowd. And also a good bunch of lads. You can always replace a ship, but uh, not 37 men. Boy, I'd come to miss that boat. As a, there again, there's another story. Only him up there can answer, I presume. The Bedfordshire's loss was not in vain. The lessons taught by those 24 anti-submarine trawlers sent by Winston Churchill and Admiral King's belated introduction of convoying ended the U-boat mayhem in American waters. When finally Admiral King was brought around to convoys, he then declared convoys are the only means for fighting U-boats. He became a very determined convert. He realized from sheer bitter experience with all these ships going down off his own coastline that convoy must be adopted, that it was the only answer and in June 1942, he, he actually did adopt convoy and immediately the U-boat sinkings fell away sharply and the U-boat's uh, happy time was over. But it was too late for the hundreds of ships that had already been lost and the thousands of men who had already died. With the end of the American happy time, Dönitz's Wolfpacks returned to the North Atlantic convoy lanes with a vengeance. At Bletchley Park, the British Code Breaking Centre, disaster had struck. Early in 1942, the Germans had improved their naval Enigma code machines by adding a fourth rotor. Overnight, the British code breakers had lost their means of deciphering the secret messages that passed between Dönitz and his crews. No longer could the Allies eavesdrop on Dönitz's orders to his boats or pinpoint their positions. Bletchley was blind. They were obviously going to concentrate on the convoys again and give up the American seaboard, or basically give it much lower priority. And we stared, therefore, in the face a problem which consisted of an unbreakable enigma, no intelligence, a known increasing number of U-boats. The German output of U-boats was reaching its peak, and uh, everybody was desperate. And we were under much pressure from the Admiralty. Uh, their liaison man would come down and say, look, you must get this U-boat cipher broken because unless there are some ways found of dealing with these U-boats, now that they're coming back to the convoys, the, the country's going to starve. 
Beneath the streets of Liverpool lay one of the best kept secrets of World War II. In this vast, bomb-proof, gas-proof bunker, a massive effort was underway to defend the vital supplies coming to Britain against U-boat attacks. Western Approaches was the world's first combined operations command headquarters. Here, Royal Navy and Air Force personnel worked together, plotting and protecting the convoy routes across the Atlantic. On their joint efforts hung not just the safe and timely arrival of each convoy, but the outcome of World War II itself. Responsible for the air war against the U-boats were RAF Coastal Command. The primary role of aircraft in the Battle of the Atlantic was to support the Royal Navy in the task of defeating the U-boat menace. U-boats were frightened about air cover right from the very start. The, the role of the aeroplanes was uh, firstly to deny the surface to the U-boats, a very important role in convoy defense. Their other role, of course, was to kill U-boats. By 1942, we had made considerable progress with better aircraft, better search equipment, the introduction of the early marks of radar, the standards of navigation improved, crew training had improved, and the introduction of the naval depth charge had made a big difference in our attack capabilities. Those attack capabilities were greatly enhanced by the purchase of American-built planes like Consolidated's PBY, the Catalina. Though lightly armed and heavy to handle, the Catalina's extended range gave air protection to the convoys against U-boat attacks further out into the Atlantic. Crew losses were high. Solitary sorties of 18 hours or more above the grey waste of the Atlantic took their toll. Mechanical failure, bad weather and human fatigue, as well as exchange of fire with the U-boats themselves, meant many planes never made it back. Air cover was very important. From Newfoundland, the aircraft could come out 500 miles. From Iceland, they could come out 500 miles. In between, there was a, about a 300 mile stretch called the Black Pit. That's where the majority of losses took place. The, the German U-boats knew that. They always had a wolf pack there in the Black Pit. They'd string it across and somewhere the convoy would have to go through it. My comeuppance came uh, at the end of 1942, when I came out with a convoy called SC-107, 45 ships, and they got us in the Black Pit. They attacked for 72 hours. They sank 15 ships. And as soon as we got aircraft to come from the other side, the battle was over. They withdrew. From that on, nothing. We got the convoy across without further incident but uh, it was a harrowing loss and a, a terrible experience. The very long-range Liberator in 1942 was a new American plane that alone had the distance capability of reaching out into the gap. One pilot, credited with more U-boat kills than anyone else, was one of the first to fly the VLR. Based in Iceland, British ace Terry Hawkeye's Bullock. We were there for over two years, and this airplane, of course, could get out to where the U-boat packs were. The Germans were very surprised to see us, but they didn't know where these aircraft suddenly appeared from. When we sighted a U-boat, our instructions were to just go hell for leather for it and attack it at any angle. I devised a, a method where we could stalk the U-boat after sighting it and attack it either up track or down track at an angle of about 20 to 25 degrees across it. We used to have to descend to a height of between 50 and 100 feet. The lower you got, the more chance you'd get the depth charges within 10 feet of the hull to make sure that it was lethal. The bombings from airplanes, they are uh, coming on to you very sudden. Aircraft have come out of the clouds within seconds. They pursued you by radar and you didn't even know. Or they sighted you out of the clouds and you did not know. Then there was a roar and the aircraft flew over the bridge just about 10 or 15 or 20 feet above you. 
and drop a series of bombs or a series of depth charges straddling the submarine. If you were lucky, none of the bombs exploded below the submarines or none of the bombs or depth charges hit the submarines. My first successful sinking was on U-boat U-597 in the Atlantic. We'd been shadowing it in and out of cloud to get in the right position. I dived from a height of 1,200 feet, and uh, I carried out my normal attack procedure. Only the bow of the U-boat had submerged, so we really caught them practically on the surface and released the depth charges at about 80 feet. That, to me, was a perfect attack. That was credited straight away as a kill. But despite such successes from the air in late 1942, Dernitz was winning the tonnage war. Shortage of VLR liberators meant the gap was not fully covered and Allied merchant sinkings had climbed to a record level. The Royal Navy and her allies at sea took the brunt of the battle. Especially towards the end of 42, things were very bad in the Atlantic. The weather was simply unbelievably atrocious regularly. The westbound convoys spread out due to weather. Losses were severe. Losses were greater than replacements. During these horrific storms which we ran into, and the water sometimes you, was 60 feet above you, and next thing you were looking down 60 feet. But that sort of weather was ideal for us from the point of view that we were free from attack, because no U-boat could stay on the surface in that sort of weather. On the Atlantic swells, which could be two, 300 yards apart, a corvette would ride up and over like a duck. You had every confidence in the corvettes. They were tough boats. But life on board the smaller escort vessels was grim in the extreme. In the Mestex themselves, they were overcrowded, grossly overcrowded, because of the extra equipment that had been put in for being on a war footing. Uh, hammocks were slung side by side and touching each other. Uh, you had a constant wash of water, inch or so of water, with all the debris that had fallen into it, swishing backwards and forwards as you rolled and pitched. Uh, people being sick. Uh, under conditions like that, of course, you had skin diseases to contend with, you had dobe itch, you had ringworm, you had even had lice at times. And quite a number of people in the escorts were lost overboard. Some even reckoned to have been washed overboard by one wave and washed back on board by the next one. In early 43, um, we were attacked by a wolf pack and uh, for six days and five nights until we got air cover, we were more or less at action stations continuously. There was very little respite. You slept on the upper deck, you got wet, and of course the guns were going off. The depth charges were being loaded and, and fired. You'd fire what they call a, a box pattern of 10 depth charges. Two would roll off the back of the destroyer or ship. Then two of the throwers would go out. Then shortly again, in a slight pause of time, say two seconds, another two throwers would go out. And then two more would drop off the back, making a total of 10 depth charges. For the enemy below, a depth charge attack was the most terrifying experience of all. Everyone is white in the face. Everyone turns very, very pale. Strangely enough, uh, people tend to look up to the ceiling and it doesn't do a bit of good. But that's where the noise was coming from. Um, you can hear a destroyer approaching. You hear the propeller noise that it goes pitcher, 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 pitcher. And then you hear the bomb dropping on the water. And then from then on, it's only seconds before it will explode. There 
is an automatic sense of wanting to preserve your life. Some people seek a different location in the ship, the control room. For very simple reason, the main hatch is through the control room. They feel they probably have a better chance of surviving by being close to the only escape there might be. Everybody was encouraged to lay down, to consume as little oxygen as possible, because we never knew how long we had to stay down. At one time, we were under attack for 36 hours. War at sea is an impersonal thing. You seldom see the enemy, uh, he's distant. You fire guns at him. In the U-boat war, you might never even see the U-boat that you sink. Now it really depends. If you're lucky and the depth charge is further away, you'll get shaken around a bit. It is not very far away. The lights go out. There's a leak here, a leak there. That's the worst part. The attack from when the depth charges go off until the attack is over. If you're lucky, you don't get hit and you come back home. If you're not, you end up on the seabed. U-boats, when they went down, they made terrible dying noises as they were crushed in the depth. And then you would get explosions. And all these things were indicative of whether you had got a genuine kill or not. We used to send away seaboats after we thought we'd killed a U-boat to see if we could pick up any evidence. Things like uh, remains coming to the surface. There were certainly stories that U-boats would send up uh, offal and uh, things of this sort uh, to try and convince us that uh, they were human remains. But the destruction of U-boats and the, the safe passage of merchant ships at sea uh, was the question and the answer to the prosecution of the war. Unless the Navy was successful in defeating the U-boats, uh, then we would go under. That was close to happening. Allied tonnage sunk in 1942 by Dönitz Wolfpacks was more than the combined total for the three previous years of war. In 1942 into March 1943, it looked as if the Allies were finally going to lose the Battle of the Atlantic, that the convoy system itself was going to break down, and that the, the seaways between the old world and the new were going to be cut, which would have meant no American expeditionary forces, no invasion of Europe, no defeat of Hitler in Western Europe. The U-boats were really unquestionably winning. They were hanging on the, the flanks of convoys at days at a time, sinking numerous merchant ships. They were really torpedoing their way to victory. At Western Approaches, the secret underground headquarters for waging the war against the U-boats, the grim realities of the situation were clear. In particular, to the hundreds of service women working there, many of whom had strong personal reasons for wishing to see the U-boats defeated. Gwen Fethney was typical. My brother was seafaring and in 1941, his convoy was attacked by U-boats. He was on a, an oil tanker, and there were 12 oil tankers in that convoy. They were all sunk just a day from home. I decided I would join the Wrens because I was so enraged by all the sinking of the ships and the loss of my brother. He was only 21. We used to feel like putting the flags out when they sunk a U-boat. It sounds a bit um, ghoulish now, but it wasn't then, believe you me. We cheered for everyone that was sunk. We knew that things were not good. By the signals that were coming in, the shipping 
we were losing. The aircraft, we were losing. There was a naval officer who one day, it must have been the end of 42, just suddenly said, we've lost it. We have only fuel for two, maybe three weeks for the whole of the country and the number of ships we have lost. There's no way we can possibly win this war now. And we were also fully aware that if we lost the Battle of the Atlantic, we'd lost everything. We knew what had gone on in other countries. What was it going to happen here? To this wonderful country of ours? It just couldn't be. I was taught a great love of my country, a great love of the people of the country. And all my country had gone through, all that my friends and people I didn't know had gone through. This could not possibly be the end. We were British. Great Britain could never be conquered.